World War II had ended. The Allies had won and Germany had lost. But the evils of the war were far from over. Millions of people had lost their lives in battle, in concentration camps and from starvation and sickness on the home front. Countries were suffering and someone had to be held accountable for the evils that had been committed. Now, the man that would have been held responsible, Adolf Hitler, had taken his own life as soon as he realized that the war was lost. He didn't want to face the consequences of his actions. But there still remained generals and leaders of the Nazi party who helped aid Hitler in committing these atrocities. And all of them had been arrested as war criminals and were getting ready to stand on trial. Now, these men were the epitome of human evil. And yet, their captors still gave them a chance for eternal life. Minister Henry Gorecki was invited to the prison where these criminals were being held, and he was asked to share with these men the gospel before they were going to be executed. Now, can you imagine having to sit in a cell with a man who helped send people to Auschwitz? You have to sit opposite this man And your task is to give to him the gospel of eternal life, the forgiveness of God for someone who's committed these atrocities. Could you do it? Would you do it? Can such men even be forgiven by God? These are the most evil men in the world. Could God really forgive them? This morning we're going to search out what what God's forgiveness is and the extent to which it can go. And we're going to find our question about our Nazi war criminals. So to do that, let's turn to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 is where we'll begin our study this morning. And what we see is God beginning to create. Why does God create? Because he's a creator. He desires to make beautiful things. He desires to have a relationship with his creation. And we read in Genesis 1 and verses 1 and 3. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And so begins this account of God creating this perfect, idyllic world. And he creates it before he makes his created beings even in it. Before there's human beings to inhabit it, God creates this beautiful world. He creates a world of order where there is light and day. There is the sun and the moon. There is the land and the sea. He creates a perfect atmosphere and environment for them to inhabit. He makes a garden that's beautiful. Isn't it interesting that God didn't make an environment that was dull and boring to look at? He made one that was beautiful for his creation to enjoy. He also gives them company. He gives them fellowship with each other. He gives Adam and Eve, his first created beings, marriage. He also gives them purpose. He doesn't just create them and say, figure out what purpose is yourself. He gives them dominion over the planet. He tells them what their life's purpose is. He makes them with value when he creates them in his own image. And he gives them rest in the Sabbath day. And so Genesis 1 and 2 is just this beautiful picture of God providing literally everything for his created beings. They come into the world. God has done all of the work for them. And then God says, how about you take tomorrow off? As though they'd done any hard work. Adam names some animals. That's about it. But God has created an entire world. And the very next day, God says to them, how about you just spend the day with me? Let's take a day off. Let's read Genesis 2 and verse 7 to just experience the the beautiful um, intimacy of God when he forms Adam. Genesis 2 verse 7, it says, The Lord God formed a man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. There's this image of God getting down in the dust, in the dirt, with his own hands forming 
what would become the first man, forming Adam with his own hands and then breathing into his nostrils the breath of life. It, it evokes this image of God almost being face to face with Adam in order to breathe into his nostrils. And then God, he gets this newly created being, Adam, who he's made everything for and who he desires a relationship with. And he gives Adam two more things. We read it in the very next verses, verses 8 and 9. He's given Adam and Eve all these things, and now he's going to give them two more things. Verse 8, it says, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man who he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. What has God given to Adam and soon to be on the scene, Eve, in these two two verses? First of all, he gives them eternal life. He gives them the tree of life to eat from. Now, Adam and Eve did not have immortality or eternal life in and of themselves. That was not something inherent to who they were. We're told in Scripture, God alone has immortality. But God allowed them access to the tree of life, which continually allowed them to live forever. And so it's this beautiful picture of Adam and Eve's complete dependence on God for life. So, but not only does he give them eternal life, he also gives them a choice because there's a second tree in the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God is very upfront with Adam and Eve in telling them what is the result of eating from this tree. In verses 16 and 17 in Genesis chapter 2, It says, the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. This tree brings death. One tree brings life. Another tree brings death. And God is very upfront. He gives Adam and Eve a warning about what, what's the result of eating from either tree. And they can choose to accept the love that God has shown them through giving them everything and continuing to eat from the tree of life. That's how they're able to show their love to God. Or now they can choose to disobey God and eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In a, in a, in a sense, it's saying that they know better than God. God's told them, don't do this. And by eating it, they say, I know better than God. I don't need him. And they can show that they no longer want to love God. Now, if we just turn on the evening news, it's no surprise to us which of the two trees Adam and Eve decided to eat from. There's no ending to the story to be spoiled here. They chose to eat from the tree that gives death. And sometimes... When we read this story, we think, well, God, why did you give Adam and Eve a choice? If there was just the tree of life and there was no tree of knowledge of good and evil, there'd be no sin in this world. There'd be no death, no pain, no suffering. None of this would be here if there was just the tree of life. Why did God give Adam and Eve that choice, knowing that they would make the wrong choice? As a parent, when you're deciding to intentionally think about having a child, these things go through your mind. You weigh up the risks and you weigh up the benefits. And one of the risks in having a relationship is always that that love that you give may not be reciprocated. There's a reward in creating life in your own image and having that life return that love of their own free choice for them to freely choose to love you with all their heart. But there's the risk that that might not be given back. And yet God, when he creates Adam and Eve, these these creatures made in his own image, he, he makes them knowing that there's a risk that they won't choose to love him back in return. And yet he decides it's worth the risk. Isn't that profound? God believed that it was worth the risk to create Adam and Eve, knowing they might not give him back the love that he is giving to them. 
And once again, the same is true of all parents. They choose to, they choose to create life knowing that there's a risk that love may or may not be given back in return. God looked at humanity and he decided that it was worth the risk and it was worth him having children even if they possibly chose not to love him. So Adam and Eve, they're standing before two trees. One gives life and one gives death and they choose the tree that brings death. Now, if you were God and you saw that, you you know, We've just started. We've had seven days of creation and then things have just begun. And sin and pain and suffering has now entered your perfect creation that you've just made. I think if we were in the place of God, some of us would be tempted to just wipe off, wipe it off, start with a clean slate. All right, that didn't work out. Let's start over again. I'll make a new Adam and Eve and maybe these ones will, you know, maybe these ones will show me love in return. But if God were to do that, what would that reveal about his character? If God was just willing to clean the slate and completely write off Adam and Eve and all of us, it'd show that he wasn't really committed. He wasn't really loyal. He wasn't actually in this for love. It would show that God was never truly interested in a loving relationship because a true interest in a loving relationship accepts when the other person does not show love back in return. True love accepts the choice of others to not show love back. And so that God chooses not to start over again shows that he is faithful and loyal and committed to Adam and Eve, but also to all of their descendants, which include us. God respects the choice they make and he decides to follow through with it rather than start over again. Wipe them off and let's do it again. But what's even more incredible is that God doesn't just accept the choice they've made. God takes it upon himself to fix the mistake that Adam and Eve Eve created. They're the ones who got themselves into this mess. And yet God is going to be the one to pick up the pieces and solve the problem that humanity put themselves into. God puts together a rescue plan that is going to be that is going to come at an extreme cost to himself. We read this in Genesis chapter 3 and verses 14 and 15, when God is um, judging the serpent who deceived Eve. Here's what he says. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are more cursed than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now the fancy term for the the verse 15, there's a fancy word for it. It's called the proto-evangelion, which simply means the first gospel or the first good news. This is the first time in scripture where we hear the gospel. It is the first gospel being preached, where God says that the evil of Satan and sin and death will finally be crushed on the head one day. And what's incredible is we look at this and you might think, well, perhaps God was caught off guard. Maybe he was caught unawares. When Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, God had to quickly put together a plan to rescue humanity. But that's not the case at all. We read in the New Testament that God had planned this plan. He'd already formulated this plan before he'd even begun to create the world. So when we read Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Before he even had done that, he had already determined in his mind what the plan of salvation would be should humanity decide to rebel against him. And God knowingly created Adam and Eve, knowing the possibility that he would have to enact this plan. I think if we were, if again, if we were in the place of God and we knew that we had to put together a plan to rescue the creation we were about to make, we probably wouldn't bother with it. Because it would come at an extreme cost to ourselves, an infinite cost. And yet God believed it was worth it. 
to have a loving relationship with his creation, it was worth the risk and it was worth the price that he would pay. So where does this first gospel come to fruition? When does God come and defeat sin and death and Satan? To rescue humanity from their own sin, God condescended himself and became a man. He was born as a baby. He had human parents. He experienced the evil and the suffering and the wickedness of this world. He experienced hunger, sickness, thirst, temptation, grief, sadness, the experiences that we live growing up in a fallen world. And what cost did it come to for Jesus? Well, Jesus left paradise in heaven to come to earth. The God-man Jesus gave up sitting on the throne of the universe in heaven to be born in a stable and grow up in a poor family. This man, Jesus, was eventually arrested for committing no crime other than preaching the good news that he had come to rescue sinners from death and give them eternal life. For this crime, Jesus was sentenced to die on a cross and be crucified. And this morning, our final passage is Luke 23. Luke 23, and we see this, this gruesome and yet almost contradictorily beautiful scene taking place in Luke chapter 23. And as we just read through these verses, we'll, we'll read through them slowly. And I just encourage you to really meditate on the, the experience that Jesus is going through on the cross here. Luke 23, and we'll begin in verse 33. And when they had come to the place called Calvary... There they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And we'll just pause. The name Calvary or Golgotha means the place of the skull. So already, if we're thinking about that first gospel that was preached, that one day the serpent's skull would be treaded on by Jesus. He would be defeated by having his skull stepped on. And here Jesus is walking to a place called the place of the skull. This is, this should be evoking to us that something big is about to happen. Something is, uh, there's a climax about to happen. All of earth's history is about to climax at this point where the first gospel given to Adam and Eve is about to take place. Verse 34, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on. But even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. What's so ironic here is that Jesus, he says earlier in the Gospels, No one takes my life from me, but I give it willingly. Jesus isn't here out of control. Jesus is fully in control of the situation. And he chooses to stay on the cross. And ironically, they say he saved others, let him save himself. But the fact that Jesus doesn't come down from the cross is how he is able to save others. Verse 36, the soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine. And they said to him, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. An inscription was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Jesus has sacrificed his throne in heaven for now his new throne, a cross. Here is Jesus' coronation ceremony as the new ruler of the earth. And his throne is not in a majestic palace. It's here on a brutal cross where he is crowned king of the Jews. He has a crown of thorns over his head. And before he was on the cross, they, the soldiers mocked him by placing royal colors and royal robes on him. Jesus gave up his throne in heaven for this brutal and gruesome throne. Verse 39, then one of the criminals who were hanged next to Jesus blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, then save yourself and us. 
But the other criminal answering rebuked him and said, Do you not even fear God, seeing that you and I under the same, are under the same condemnation? And we are justly so. We're receiving the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then the man said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. This man that Jesus is speaking to is deserving of the death that he is suffering. He even admits it. He says to the other criminal, we deserve to be here on this cross. We deserve this. He acknowledges his sin, but then he also acknowledges who Jesus is. And he calls out to Jesus for help, to rescue him. And he calls out to Jesus as Lord. And he believes that Jesus is able to save him. And Jesus gives him eternal life. Now this word paradise, assuredly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. That word uh, in Greek is paradisios. Pretty easy to remember. Paradise, paradisios. And when the Old Testament was translated into Greek, the word paradisios was used quite frequently, but it's always used in the exact same way. Have a look at this. If we go back to the text that we read this morning, Genesis 2, the Lord God planted a garden. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden. God took the man, put him in the garden, put him in the garden of Eden. We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden all over Genesis. This word garden that comes over and over and over again. The word for garden is paradisios or paradise. And so if we, were to re- if we were to read it again, we could read it as the Lord God planted a paradise eastward and eastern. He, God drove the man out from paradise eventually. So this word garden is exactly the same as the word for paradise. Every time you read the word garden in Genesis 1 through to 3, the word being used is paradise. Humanity's disobedience to God drives them out from paradise. And now here is Jesus inviting this criminal to come and enter back into paradise. Humanity was kicked out of the garden, and now Jesus invites this criminal to come back into the garden with him. As Jesus lay there hanging on the cross, he takes on the sins of the world, past, present, and future. He takes on the guilt of our disobedience to God. And in so doing, when Jesus took his final breath and when he died, he died taking the punishment of death that we deserve for our sins. I don't think it's any coincidence that Jesus died on a cross. Crosses, of course, made from the wood of trees. And as Jesus hangs on this tree that symbolizes death, In effect, he becomes a new tree of life, a tree that provides eternal life to all who believe in it. Humanity lost access to the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. So Jesus comes down to earth to become a new tree of life that promises to take us back into paradise. If we were to explain it visually, I'd say it's like this. God, he initially... There is a tree of life that is accessible to humanity in paradise. But then because of humanity's sin, they are driven from paradise into death. And Jesus, as he looks at this problem, he wants to bring humanity back from death, back into paradise. And so in order for him to do that, he must follow humanity to death. Jesus, because humanity can no longer access that tree of life, Jesus comes and at the cross becomes a new tree of life accessible to all humanity. Jesus then passes through death, but he also resurrects. He rises again. And we see that as Jesus goes back into paradise, 
the invitation is now open to all of humanity to follow Jesus from death back into paradise. The question is whether or not we will choose to follow Jesus into that place. In the Garden of Eden, there were two people, Adam and Eve. And they had two trees, one tree that brought life and one tree that brought death. Two people are hanging beside Jesus, and both of them are hanging on a tree of death. And in the middle of them is a tree of life. Two people, once again, in front of two trees. One man chooses death, the tree of death. The other man chooses to look at the tree of life and be brought back into paradise. What happened to those war criminals, those Nazi soldiers? What did was Goreke successful at all in bringing these people into the kingdom? Well, Goreke ministered to 11 people in prison and he studied the Bible with each one of them. And he explained to them the plan of salvation and the love of God. And he no doubt read the exact same stories we've read this morning, the fall of man and the redemption and salvation of humanity as Jesus rescues us. And each one of them he invited to eat from the tree of life. One man, Alfred Rosenberg, said to Greke, if my colleagues are naive enough to accept your counseling, you go ahead and work with them, but don't bother with me. He went to the gallows, and Greke prayed silently behind him. Another leader, Hermann Goring, When told about the divinity of Jesus, the God-man, he said, This Jesus you always speak of, to me, he is just another smart Jew. And rather than face trial, he took cyanide. He swallowed cyanide so he wouldn't have to face the gallows. Given the choice between life and death, these men sadly chose death. But some men chose life. Wilhelm Kietel was one of Hitler's closest military advisors. advisors. And he said to Goreke, you have helped me more than you know. May Christ, my Savior, stand by me all the way. I shall need him so very much. Because of his crimes, Kietel was eventually hanged as well. But before he did, he and Goreke shared a meal of communion together. Of those 11 men that Greke ministered to, four of them gave their life to Jesus and shared a meal of communion before their death sentence. God is so loving that the blood and the body of his son, Jesus Christ, are made available even to war criminals. God has provided mercy and grace, forgiveness and eternal life for all who believe. Rest assured that if God can forgive Nazi officers, criminals, murderers, he can forgive you. You are not able to outsin the grace of God. Jesus has paid it all for you to be saved and to enter into paradise with him. So just like Adam and Eve, just like the criminals hanging on the cross, Just like these criminals that Gareke spoke to, you too are standing between two choices, life and death. Will you choose to look at the cross, the tree of life, and enter into paradise? This morning, you have the opportunity to accept this this sacrifice of Jesus in a very special way as we partake in communion. We'll be eating bread and drinking grape juice, which represents the very body and blood that Jesus shed for us on the cross. And these elements are open to all who have searched their heart and have made sure that they are in a right relationship with God. A relationship of repentance of sins and acceptance of Jesus' sacrifice. So this morning I invite you to partake of these elements and symbolically remember the death of Jesus on the cross and choose life.